Now, can you give us an example of an actual area in which Aristotle puts this approach to work and starts identifying in some specific field what sorts of things there are? Well, now we can turn, I think, to an area that's really very close to his general metaphysics, since his general metaphysics is already concerned quite closely, as we see with things like human beings, dogs, and other natural entities, to the area of philosophy of nature. Now here, Aristotle is interested in trying to say what kinds of explanations the philosopher of nature can give across the board, how many kinds of explanations the philosopher is going to find useful. He tells us that philosophy, in fact, begins with a sense of wonder before the world of nature, that when we see the world, we're struck by awe and wonder because we see these wonderful things going on and we can't understand why they work as they do. He says it's rather like seeing a puppet show where you see these mechanisms moving and you know that behind there, there must be some hidden mechanism that explains why it moves as it does, but you don't know yet what it is and you want to search and find out. Now, the question is, what kind of explanation are you searching for when you ask this why question? Why does it work as it does? Now here, Aristotle thinks that lots of philosophers have been too simple because they fail to notice how many different ways we ask and answer these why questions. And he wants to say that there's not just one kind of explanation that's useful here, but in fact, an open-ended list, but at any rate, at least four types seem to him to be quite important. Now these are, of course, the famous four causes. We hear about Aristotle's four causes. I think it's important to say that those are really four kinds of explanations. That They're four B causes. Four B causes, yes, yes. that's good. Yes. Um, four kinds of answers to yeah. why questions. Yeah. And, of course, they're uh, called the material cause. And here the material form of explanation says, um, say we take the question, why does a tree grow as it does? Well, the material question, material explanation will say, the tree grows as it does because it's made of such and such materials. Now, that form of explanation is very useful and interesting, but we can already guess that Aristotle is going to think it can't do the work alone without this other kind of explanation, which he calls the formal explanation, that says the tree grows as it does because it's structured in such and such a way. That is its form. So you see here the link with the metaphysical arguments. Then there's a third kind called the efficient cause or efficient explanation, which says the tree grows as it does because various things from the environment push it in certain ways, perhaps the incoming materials or the earth and so on, push it from behind in such and such ways. Then the last one, which I think has been the most misunderstood one, is the one that he calls the final cause, and which we often call the teleological form of explanation because it refers to an end or telos towards which the thing moves. Now this says the tree grows as it does for the sake of becoming a certain sort of mature tree. In other words, things in nature are always moving towards the flourishing of their adult condition. Now, that... So there's a mystical or magical element in that that doesn't appear in any of the others, or there uh -huh. seems to be. Well, see, that, I think, I want to say that's a misunderstanding, too. Um, first of all, Aristotle's not saying that there's anything magical out there in the future that goes down and pulls the tree towards its future form, as it were, from the future, exerting a causal pull from the future. No, it's all quite natural. It's happening within the tree itself. It's a way of talking about the plastic and resourceful behavior of living things. It's a way of offering a unified account of the way that things like trees, in a variety of different natural circumstances, always move in the way that promotes their continued life and their development towards their mature form. So you see, it's saying that in a variety of different climates and weathers, the tree will always move towards the sun and its roots will go towards water and the source of nourishment. And that's a perfectly general explanation which will give us a way of understanding the variety of the different things that the tree does. So you see, in that there's nothing supernatural. There also isn't anything that refers to powers of mind or desire inside the tree itself. It's just a way of talking about the resourcefulness of natural movement. Now, a lot of scholars have, uh, have accredited to Aristotle the notion that there are souls in everything. Do you think they've understood him correctly? And is that part of his teleological explanation? No, I think they have misunderstood the way he uses teleological explanations. I think he uses them only for living beings in the first place. I don't think he uses teleological explanations at all for things like 
eclipses, thunderstorms, and so on. In fact, he says that eclipse is not for the sake of anything. But in the case of living beings, it's not a matter of mind or soul in our sense, where that seems to imply some power of mind. It's a matter of the general character of what has life. Now, now we get to his work on life. Now, this word, life, uh, is often translated by our word soul. He wrote a work that was called On Suke, which really means on life or the principle of life, and it's usually translated in English as on the soul. Now, in reality, I think our word soul contains so many con connotations of spirituality and mentality that it's misleading to use that word here. And we had better think of this as a general inquiry into life than the living. What Aristotle tries to do in this work is ask and answer the question, what is the animating principle in living things of many different kinds, including plants, animals, human beings? Can we give some general account of what it is to be alive? And the answer he gives is that the animating principle is the form of a living body that's potentially organized so as to function, exercise the functions of life. Now, by form, of course, he means not mere shape or configuration, but as we've already seen, he means a kind of functional structure or organization. So what it would be for you, Brian McGee, to be alive would be to be organized so that you can nourish yourself, so that you can perceive, think, exercise all the functions that are characteristic of your type of life. And what Aristotle is saying is that this is an organization of matter. It's got to be realized at every point in some matter, but it's that organization that's your life. It's not the matter that makes it up. So that when it's when you lose those functional structures that you would be dead. And he applied the same principle to non-living things, didn't he? I remember there's one point in his writings where he says that if an axe had a soul, then that soul would be cutting. In other words, what he's saying is that, that somehow the essence of an axe, for example, is what it does, is its function. Isn't that right? Yeah. Now, he uses that, of course, counterfactually. He says, if, if it had. Yeah. And the way he uses it is to illustrate this point that by form, he doesn't just mean the, the axe-like shape, and he doesn't mean the fact that it's made of such and such metal, but he means the power to exercise certain functions. So this is a way of giving us some insight into the more mysterious case of the living creature, that what it would be for that creature to have a certain animating principle is, of course, not, not for you, Brian McGee, to have exactly a certain shape, because, of course, you could change your shape without I, being dead. <laughs> I've, I've done it frequently. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but what it is, of course, yeah. is to have that <laughs> power to function in various ways, and it's losing that that you would be dead. Yeah. Now, we've covered a lot of ground, and even so, it touches on only a tiny fraction of Aristotle's output. That's inevitable in the short time that we have. But can you take three paces back from what we've been talking about and draw some implications from it to modern philosophy? What contemporary concerns in philosophy are being directly influenced by Aristotle's work? Well, I think one is the one we've just been discussing, in fact, the philosophy of, of life. And here, uh, we call this area the philosophy of mind, uh, cordoning off in a way that Aristotle wouldn't do the mental powers of perception and thought from the rest of the functions of life. But I think in his general work on life, he has some very important conclusions for contemporary philosophy of mind. He tries to show us how material reductionism that says that perception is simply a material process of a certain sort is inadequate to explain the functional characteristics of life. And on the other hand, in order to reject material reductionism, we don't have to introduce some mysterious immaterial entities. But what we want to say is that perception is a process that cannot be reduced to a material process because it's realized in always different matter and because the notion of intentionality and outward focusing is fundamental to the correct characterization of the sort of awareness perception is. But on the other hand, it's not anything mysterious or separate from matter either, but it is a function that's always, as, it would, as he puts it, constituted in matter, realized in some matter or other.